324 BC. We're in Susa. He's done all this stuff in the east, far east, and he's come back to Iran. And he decides to hold a mass wedding, a kind of moony wedding. Uh, allegedly 10,000 of his troops, who had been in a relationship with an oriental woman of some sort, a camp follower, their re uh, relations are solemnized, and Alexander gives them presents. He's extremely rich. But more important than that is that he and about 70 of his closest companions, Greeks, Macedonian Greeks and others, marry Persian women. And uh, Rachel was talking about the three years that he's in uh, what we call Afghanistan. Well, one of the things that happened there was extraordinarily um, important and very odd. He marries um, a Bactrian woman um, called, of course, Roxani, Roxana today. And this is his first of three wives. His next two wives are Persians, high-ranking Iranian royal women. He never marries a Greek woman. He marries consecutively and um, at the same time three Oriental women. And he has this mass wedding say, what's going on? Well, to me, this is extraordinarily un-Greek. It is most far-sighted and most inclusive. He is not normal. He has a vision which is beyond that which, as far as I know, anybody had ever expressed. Aristotle thought all non-Greeks were barbarians fit mainly to be slaves. And, and this is part of a, a wider potentially programme or unintentional programme of, of Persianising that Alexander is going through at this time as well. One very, very controversial thing he does is introduce a practice called proskinesis in the Greek, which is a Persian habit of bowing down before the ruler completely flat, prostrating yourself. Now, good democratic or semi-democratic Greeks, th this is something that's completely revolting to them, and it's very, very controversial for Alexander to do this. And in fact, there, there is a strain in modern historiography that suggests that Alexander is not just the, the first ruler of a new Hellenistic Greek Middle East, uh, he's also the last ruler of the, the Persian Empire in the old style as well, maintaining many of their traditions. Now, there's also tales in your mouths about him becoming a tremendous drunk and even killing one of his best friends at a dinner party because he was drunk. What evidence do you have and how does that play in, Diana? Well, I think, you know, there is almost no evidence apart from our, our, our Roman historians in effect. But I think what, what we're seeing with these stories of, of increasingly drunken rages or eccentric aberrant if behaviour, true. if they're true, we're seeing instances really of what, what Paul and Rachel have just been talking about, this sense that as the 320s were going on, Alexander was turning into something other than a Macedonian ruler. So we could start with the plot um, that supposedly was um, happening earlier in the 320s, um, which one of... Alexander's inner circle, a general called Philotas, supposedly knew about but didn't tell him about and obviously decided to hedge his bets, stay on the sidelines, perhaps. Alexander finds out about the plot and has Philotas executed, tried and executed. He then had to have Philotas' father, another very senior um, general in the, the, the team, Parmenion, executed, because, of course, you couldn't allow the father to stay alive when the son has been executed for treason. So that starts a kind of a process of distancing Alexander from his central, his core team that, that Paul was talking about. And this starts to become increasingly evident when we see stories like the one you just mentioned of Clitus. Clitus, a very old family friend, in effect, someone who was uh, related to the nurse that that brought him up as a child. Clitus has been with him all the way through the campaigns. And Clitus is, in the sources, a plain speaker. He's somebody from the old country who believes that he needs to give Alexander a word or two to tell him where he's going wrong. Unfortunately, he chooses a banquet at which a lot of drink has been taken in order to, to make this point. And he says, you know, Alexander, you need to get back a hold of yourself. You're becoming a Persian. You're no longer one of us. Alexander is incensed and he actually um, stabs him with a spear and kills him as part of the banquet. And then... Alexander himself is killed. Is it assassination, Paul, or what is it? Yes, well, this is the million-dollar question. Did he die of natural causes, that is, say, malaria as a result of uh, lots of wounds and an infection, or was it a plot amongst his inner circle? Was he poisoned? Um, I think the jury is out. Um, maybe my friends have um, very strong views, but I think probably on the whole more likely is that he died of natural causes in the sense they're partly self 
self-inflicted, that's to say the terrible wounds that he had suffered front, back, everywhere, and he was weak uh, by the time that um, this uh, infection uh, seized upon him and it was deadly. He'd nearly died several times before. But he turned back, but instead of going back the easy way, he went back by ah. as difficult a way as he could manage. What did he do that for? Paul? Well, you're quite right. I mean, this is part of the showboating in India. This, this um, supports the view that the Indian um, campaign was merely showboating, and therefore to choose the more difficult way rather than the easy way back along the Makran, along the Persian Gulf, where there wasn't any water, and where um, it's desert conditions and so on. Well, that was just crazy, and a lot of his troops died. But um, I I have no more comment than that, that um, he, he could have argued that he wanted to link up with his fleet. One of his mm. oldest friends was um, educated with him uh, as a youth, and Niarchos was a Greek from Crete, and he was in charge of the navy. And so you could argue that the navy and the army should um, keep in sync. Uh, there are you know, rational arguments you can make as well as irrational. When he died at 32, 33? 32, nearly, 32, nearly 33. When he died at 32, what was, what was thought of him? What was his reputation? Paul said invincible, he became yeah. known as the great. Do we have sources which are accurate enough to tell us what people thought of him at that time? I think the really telling thing is what, is what happens to Alexander's body after his death. Um, there, there is a notion that uh, he, he, dies in, he dies in Babylon, and there's a notion that the appropriate thing would be for his body, his funeral cortege, to go to Macedonia for him to be buried with his ancestors. What happens is that very quickly after Alexander's death, his generals par uh, parcel up temporary control of the empire between them and Ptolemy, one of Alexander's closest companions from childhood, gets Egypt. Now Ptolemy has long-term ambitions in Egypt. He does end up founding a dynasty which concludes with the, the famous Cleopatra. And what Ptolemy does is hijacks Alexander's funeral cortege and brings the body to Alexander's city of Alexandria in northern Egypt where it's set up and gives legitimacy to his dynasty. So whatever people may have thought about him on a per personal level, Level, he's a very important source of legitimacy for the rulers who fo follow him. I think it's also interesting to note that as, as Rome starts to expand into what was Alexander's territories in the Mediterranean, the Greek historian Polybius attempting to explain, you know, what has happened, what is this new power doing in the Mediterranean world, that Polybius uses Alexander as a, as a kind of an example or a comparative um, for what, what, what the Roman impact on the Mediterranean could become. So we can see even fairly soon after Alexander's death, he's becoming a model for successive modes of imperialism. And in the Egypt that Ptolemy was ruling, uh, and the Ptolemies ruled, there developed what's called, we call it, the Alexander Romance, which has meant that Alexander features in something like 70-plus national literatures, including, for example, Chaucer and Shakespeare. And I was very sorry he was cut out from the current version of Hamlet, uh, the Barbican. <laughs> but, but this romance means that in art and in literature, Alexander performs all sorts of roles. He's a terrific knight in the Middle Ages. He's an ex explorer, he goes up to heaven, he goes down to the bottom of the sea. He is um, the most famous, probably, single individual, taking it all together the last 2,500 years. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul Cartlidge, Dinah Spencer and Rachel Mears. Uh, if you have a subject for In Our Time that you think deserves a radio audience and will make Radio 4 listeners in the UK and around the world sit up and take notice, please send your ideas to us through our website by the 29th of October. One of them will be the subject of In Our Time on the 3rd of December. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. I, th I mean, I think it's it's very interesting that we've seen Alexander played so unsuccessfully through cinematic adaptation. Um, Why do you think that is? I think I think one of the things that's most complex about Alexander is also what's most interesting about him, which which is that sort of that odd thing, which is charisma. You know, how do you yeah, capture yeah. charisma? How do you capture that idea of someone who can speak equally powerfully to troops in the field and also compel powerful, you know, robber barons in effect yeah. from, from the, the world of, of Philip and, and his I think Rossen father. got wrong the balance between yeah. what was going on in Greece. Uh, he spent the first two thirds of the film getting Alexander to Asia yeah. and therefore the last bit was just too rushed. And it was very studio bound as well. Yeah. Everyone just didn't oh, well, feel that. Was probably that technology. 
I'm Whereas sure it was Oliver Stone in the early 2000s, he has the possibility to do everything. He can stage pitched battles, and he staged two. Um, he goes over to Asia. He has Babylon, all that stuff. Yeah. Which, yeah. Mm. But he couldn't, I think, make... I met Oliver, and uh, I asked him about this, but he couldn't make up his mind whether Alexander was to be admired mm. as a great hero or to be empathised with as a troubled person. He mm. wasn't quite happy killing lots of people, but he was very sensitive and he had this wonderful relationship with Hephaestion and he wasn't, in other words, the brutal conqueror, which mm. I think most of my colleagues, you may be exceptions, but most of my colleagues now, I think, take a very negative view mm. of Alexander, partly because we're not wildly keen on imperialism these mm. days. Mm. You know, we just don't have that empathetic view that it's okay in it itself to wish to rule lots and lots of other people. What do your students think? Well, some of them begin the term by, by talking about Alexander in the terms of the, the greatest conqueror the world has ever seen. Mm. And once I've explained that we don't use that phrase, uh, we, we... Why did you use it? Well, because it, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't ask any questions. It's completely unnuanced. It starts with an assumption and it also starts with the, the idea that this is in some way a competition that, you know, there, there is a greatest and a second greatest and a third greatest and so forth. And I think Alexander is a, a wonderful teaching tool in a lot of ways because he's so complex and nuanced. The sources are tricky to work with and he's, he's a figure that a lot of people project things onto. So it's he's a useful figure for making students think about what they're bringing to the interpretation of the subject. What is it that they are looking for in, in the past? I mean, I think you're you're spot on, actually, Rachel, in, in that idea that that we have always, I say we, you know, people have always projected their own fears, anxieties, desires onto Alexander, and I think that's that's in part because of all of the things that we've been saying in a way over the last sort of hour or so, which which is that he was he was a radically different brand of leader even in his own time, and I think that that has really percolated to us through other radical brands of imperialism um, which have picked up on the notion of a charismatic central figure who is at the same time kind of one of the people. And the Romans pick up on that very vividly but other popular imperialising movements or, or movements that started as, as popular anyway, Napoleon I think Paul mm. mentioned earlier, Egypt. Egypt of course you yeah. know picks up on Alexander very vividly and again there's that kind of issue of someone who starts off one of the people part of a revolutionary movement but becomes an establishment figure to be this you know, this dissolute figure that, that comes oh, out, is, yeah. is there much evidence for that? Was he... I mean, I can see yeah, him becoming a Persian yeah. potentate because yeah. he wants yeah. to... A tyrant. Because yeah. of, and I think Paul explained that very well, that he's going beyond what had gone before. But the idea of being um, a sort of drunk at a... Yeah, at a yeah. party and murdering his best friend, you think, oh, was it, did that really well? Did that, what evidence is for that murder of his good friend? I don't think we have any direct evidence. What we have evidence through is, is the works of someone like Arian, as, yeah. as Paul was yeah. mentioning. I mean, it wouldn't be possible to make that up no. um, because Clytus was, as you said, so closely yeah. involved and yeah. actually he saved yeah. Alexander's life exactly. at, the, at the first okay. battle yeah. of the Granicus. And, and there, there is an established Macedonian tradition of getting very drunk at parties, yeah. so yeah. that's not yeah. surprising. Is that there. Macedonian? Is that where it comes from? Do we owe it to Macedonian? Yes, I think we can blame the Macedonians. <laughs> but I think there's also the issue that, you know, you're, you're on campaign there are probably issues with water and with availability of water but you're carrying wine with you mm. um, so you actually potentially are, are more likely get to get quicker. to get high quicker yeah, you're not yeah. you'd have no potential to mess necessarily to mix your wine mm. in the way that you would expect as, mm. as a Greek so I think you know th there might have been I suppose functional reasons why there was more drinking going on even over and above Macedonian cultural practices well Victoria comes in the producer too